for me, I love Fridays. Now, it's not because it's Friday, per se, because it could be Saturday, and I love that. But you see, one day a week, my wife and I choose to have what some would call, I guess, a date night, you know, which <laughs> for us, <laughs> as old as we are, date night's not quite the same as what your kind of date night might be. We just kind of like to go to a place and go dancing. And we enjoy this activity together because my wife would probably do anything just together with me and just enjoy our, each other's company because we don't like being alone. <laughs> so we like each other. So because we like each other, we're together. No, <laughs> but seriously, we spend one day a week going because we enjoy it. And because there's a native casino nearby, we just happen to enjoy getting free <laughs> live music. And so we can dance to it and we can just have fun and it's kind of nice. You know, we don't we don't drink, you know, and we don't gamble. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, it's fun. You know, and I know a lot of other people probably have issues with drinking and gambling and all kinds of other things, you know, and for them, I don't recommend doing that <laughs> because they have issues. But me, I don't have the issue. <laughs> okay, maybe I have one issue. Mmm, a bottle of Pepsi is a wondrous thing. Gives me strength and lots of spring. Tastes so good plus always strong. Costs so little yet lasts so long. I'm sure that if you taste this drink, you sit back and really think what this drink was meant to be. Pepsi Cola for you and me. Maybe I do have some issues. But irregardless of my Pepsi addiction, <laughs> I enjoy spending that time with my wife, you know, and it's something that gives me a chance to just not think, to not act, to not react, to just dance, you know, and I love dancing. I've always loved dancing. It's been a part of my life since I was a little child and my mother used to dance. You know, I grew up dancing, and so I have fun with it, and uh, I look forward to it. You know, and that's kind of what God does with us. He looks forward to doing things with us. He enjoys our company. He wants us to enjoy His company. You know, we should find those things together that He and I, or you and Him, enjoy doing together. Besides, you know, kind of like thousands of people, you know, con congregated together in a congregation or a church or hundreds or whatever your size of your fellowship may be, he likes to spend time alone with you, you know, like a date night. Well, you could make it a daily date morning if you wanted to, you know, by spending quality time with him in the morning, you know, but you could spend time with him maybe at noon if you're not a morning person or maybe at night. But you know, I got a little secret. You know, if you're going to study utmost for his highest, you know, which is what we're doing, and you're going to give all that you are to him to accomplish his purposes in the world that he wants to do with you, then you may want to spend a little more time than a date night. You may want to spend all your time with God. In other words, be in the consciousness, awareness of a relationship that you have with him because he's in you. And when you are, then you want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You want to accomplish things that make him happy, that he enjoys seeing in you as you go out to do those things that he wants you to do. When you do that, then you examine yourself and you apply to yourself teachings that you can find, applications of the word that specifically are designed for your lifestyle and your choices that you've made according to the grace that's been given you. Because all things are lawful to you. That's the easy part. You know, I mean, technically the laws of the land apply to you because you should obey them, even as Jesus said, because the subject, uh, people that are subject to those laws, wherever you live, God has put those authorities above you for your protection, whether you know it or not, and whether they're evil or right or good or bad or whatever they may be, God put them there for a reason and a purpose to accomplish his own plan. So, you know, if you want to not be under those laws, get out of that country. <laughs> but as a born-again Christian, subject to the place that you live, you submit yourself to those authorities that are above you. And that's why normally 
born again Christians that are walking after the Spirit of God are usually a blessing to the land. Most authorities recognize that because correct perspective of a Christian is that this kingdom is not of this world, that we live in a kingdom that is to come, and we don't have a problem with those issues that are going on around us, unless, you know, they're directly contradictory to the Bible. And then we say, well, no, you know, you'd go do that, I don't want to do that. So, it's kind of interesting is, I was looking at today's devotional in utmost for his highest because we do the utmost video to inspire ourselves to recognize in us that we need to change something and so I was noticing that um, there's a perspective in here that I always am fascinated by whenever I bring up in other teachings something about Jesus that really gets my goat really you know kind of makes me go you know, and I want to wring somebody's neck, meaning Christians. <laughs> After all, you know, sinners, they can't help it. They're just sinners, you know, and ungodly, they can't help it. They're ungodly. They haven't a clue what's going on. But Christians, man, they're supposed to know what's going on. After all, they got the Holy Spirit inside to teach them. They got God to speak to them. They got Jesus to intercede for them. What's the problem? But I want to wring their neck sometimes when they tell me about what Jesus said and what he meant. You know, today, in utmost video, we're going to talk about exactly what frustrates me. No, we're going to talk about how the answer to something that's always been kind of contradictory in Scripture. You know, when Jesus said, judge not, he used the command form, judge not, lest he be judged. For with what measure you judge, you shall be judged. And whatsoever you meet, you shall be meted unto you. So, people have gone out of their way to try to make this a dogma or a doctrine. They've tried to say, well, you can't judge me, so I'm going to do what I want. Well, in some ways, that's true. <gasps> it is? You mean I can't judge that person? What do you mean I can't judge? I can discern. Well, of course you can discern. That's why we call it discern, discern. I can decide yes of course you can decide you make a decision between two opposite polarities you know left right up down sideways corners you know whatever you may be but judge not meant making a judgment decision based upon your authority and while you may have been given some authority in some respects if you look at heaven you're going to discover that there were four and twenty elders that threw down their crowns you're going to discover that any time that you look at Jesus, he committed himself to him who was able to judge righteously. He did not judge anyone. Because he was able to, he was capable of, and he had the authority to do all those things. And yet he said, I don't judge you. Because Jesus, as the Son of God, Jesus, as the Son of Man, committed all judgment to him who could judge righteously, who could see the heart. He exemplified what he taught, judge not. Because you may find yourself, when you judge, being judged by the same measure that you thought was right, but when you find out it works against you, you'll say, well, you don't understand, and it's too late. You likewise didn't understand also at the time that only God is a judge of man. Man cannot judge himself. He's not able to see the heart. But God is. So, because man only looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart, then the only one that could judge righteously is God. We can judge all right, but our judgment is always unrighteous. It has never been perfect like God is perfect. So judgment is reserved unto he who can judge righteously. Now, if you want to go ahead and nitpick and say Jesus didn't mean you know what he said because he was just talking about hypocrites, ooh, I suggest that you read the last of that chapter. You know, Matthew 24, you know, or Matthew 24. Matthew, where the Sermon on the Mount is, or Luke, where the Sermon on the Mount is, where it says at the end of it, that man that did these sayings of mine, I will liken unto him as a man who built his house upon a rock. That when the storms of life came, his house stood 
for it was founded upon a rock. But the man who did not do these sayings of mine, I will liken him unto a man who built his house upon sand. And when the storms came, he was destroyed. The destruction was great thereof. If you look at that and examine what he said, these sayings of mine is everything in the Sermon on the Mount. And everybody knows, really, unless they were really persuaded otherwise to try to you know, come up with a way of escape to not have to do what Jesus said. Because when Jesus said things to the crowd, they knew what he meant. When Jesus says it to you, you know what he means. You don't have to play games with it. You don't have to try to come up with a religious sidestep or side issue or, you know, well, the pastor said, well, the church said, well, they said, this said, that said, anybody said, anybody did, anybody was, anybody could get away with it. Because, after all, you're unwilling to ask God what he said. But when you do, you know well as well as I do what Jesus said is true. Judge not, for with what measure you judge, you shall be judged. The first point is, judge not is a command, period. It's trying to give you a way you know, to understand life in a better way, because if you let God do the judging, God's responsible for the results. You do the judging, somebody's responsible for the results, and guess what will happen? You'll stand before God with your judgment. Careful, it can come back to bite you, and it will. The test of self-interest. If thou wilt take thy left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Genesis 13.9 As soon as you begin to live the life of faith in God, fascinating and luxurious prospects will open up for you. Opportunities, networking, this chance, that chance, everybody gives you an opportunity to do what they are presenting to you to do. And these things are yours by right. It is your privilege. But if you are living the life of faith, you will exercise your right to waive your rights and let God choose for you. But, 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 but I have the right to bear arms. Yes, but you let God choose for you. But I have the right to dissent and to argue and to create, you know, uh, <laughs> protest. I, I have the right to protest. I have the right to, you know, congregate in a way that is working against, you know, what I see is wrong. True, but you let God choose for you. But I have these rights and privileges that I was granted certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness true but God will choose for you so you see there's lots of rights but there's ways of application lots of people get that really fun to play with because they always assert that right oh sure you have a right but the way you apply it may be wrong <laughs> and that's why the court systems are so interesting in the ways that they apply what is written according to what the circumstances of the case presented before them is. And so likewise, God takes life as the same situation. He applies that right against his law and applies the circumstances accordingly of whether you have accepted his way of salvation or rejected it by your own self-determination of choosing your own way that you should go. So you could choose to do your will or you could choose to do his will. When you are saying not my will but thy will be done you are giving up your rights. From the moment that you got saved you were given a course an inheritance now, you could be like that unprofitable servant or that prodigal son who took his inheritance now and exercises his authority every single day, runs right out and spends his inheritance so that when you have a responsibility to God when you get there, 
and he asked for his inheritance, what have you done with it? You can say, I invested it, I divested it, I spent it on myself. Or rather, you could say, I gave it back to you and you chose for me what I should do. So you see, the reality of our lives is not so much about the independence, but dependence upon God as he leads us. That's why we're giving our utmost and always look at giving our uttermost to him. Because it's we give him all or we give him nothing. For he has said, I would rather you be hot, like on fire, like really, you know, just sizzling, than be, what, lukewarm, kind of like, well, you know, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't, maybe, you know, when I, when I get a word on it, you know, and, you know, but Lord, that just wasn't our ministry, we didn't feel led, you know. Or maybe, you know, I'll kind of think about it and pray about it for a while. He would rather you say, no, I don't want to and I'm not going to, period. Because then you're cold. Because he would rather you be cold or hot, but not lukewarm. So likewise, in the manner of your life, you need to choose to be all in or all out. God sometimes allows you to get into a place of testing where your own welfare would be the right and proper thing to consider if you were not living a life of faith. But if you are living a life that Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns will I find faith, if you are living that kind of life, then you will joyfully waive your right and let God choose for you. This is a discipline by means of which the natural is transformed and the supernatural or the spiritual by obedience to the voice of God. The natural is transformed by obedience to hearing God speak to you personally in every situation and circumstance of your life as you do what God tells you to do. I have a famous expression that I say all the time in ministry, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. I support anyone who tells me God told them to do something. And I say, well, God bless you. I support you in you doing what God told you to do. I won't go with you because if God doesn't tell me to go with you, I will watch and see how the Lord brings to you the accomplishment of that purpose in you and with you. But I will not stop you or say that God hasn't told you to do something if you are telling me that. I will leave you to God and your relationship with him. Because after all, that is personal and I won't be there when you stand before God to answer or to renounce what it is you've told me he said. Whenever right is made the guidance in the life, it will blunt the spiritual insight. When you think to do right, you're not thinking to do what God said. You're thinking what is right, not what Jesus said to you personally. If God has told you to do something, you do it. Not doing what is right, but doing what God said. Sounds strange. It'll be tested. You'll see. Ask Abraham. The great enemy of the life of faith in God is not sin, but the good which is not good enough. Good enough is always through obedience. Good is just simply an evaluation of what seems like the right thing to do at the temporal or temporary time that you think it applies to. Only God can see the consequences, the future, and the investment of what you're doing and how it applies throughout eternity. So he chooses best for what works for the rest of all of your life. And you only choose what's best for your temporary situation that you're in. So you see, he's eternal and you're temporal. You don't know what tomorrow will bring, but he does. So he plans for that accordingly. It would seem the wisest thing in the world for Abraham to choose. It was his right and the people around him would consider him a fool for not choosing. But he gave that choice to Lot. Many of us do not go on spiritually because we prefer to choose what is right instead of on relying on God to choose for us. We have to learn to walk according to the standard which has its eye on God. Walk before me, the Lord says. Every day we have that choice. We can do what is right in our own eyes. We can do what seems like the right thing to do. 
we can do those things that seem like our rights and privileges and honors and responsibilities that we have deemed necessary. But the facts of the matter is, is on the day that you wake up in the morning and you say, oh, it's my responsibility to go to work. And God says, if you had met him in the morning, don't go, there'll be an earthquake and it'll destroy the building. Then I question you whether or not you are obeying the right thing to do by killing yourself because you were doing what seemed right in your own eyes. Or would you not have been obedient to hearing God's voice and doing as he said? For you see, the life we live is one of directive life. It is directed by God. It is inspired by God. And that is what it means to walk in the Spirit of God. Because God will direct us, as he promised in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, meaning not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledging him, and he will direct your path. The he is God. And your heart, obviously, is your own choices you make. So the question will always be, when we do what we do as we've done what we did, have we done it according to the word of God as he's told us, or just according to what we thought was right when we read it at the time? Because that's the matter and the crux of our lives. Are we obedient, or are we doing good, thinking that we're righteous, because we're religious.